Today on The Deep End, we discuss this week in cancel culture, it's happening again, uh, a history lesson in anti-Christian bias, perhaps we'll go there, and also Little Nas X is perhaps, perhaps the world's most honest pagan. Plus, we're going to get into the life of David. This is your favorite night of the week. Welcome to The Deep End with Tim Hatch. I am beloved. The man they call David, the son of a Jesse, the John I slay it, the heart full of king, three stones in a sling. I'm dancing my clothes off to the sound of the beat. Ah. Yeah. Welcome to the deep end with Tim Hatch. Welcome. Welcome everybody back into the deep end for another episode. I know we said last week that we would not be doing an episode on Holy Week, but there's so much happening and I just love doing this. And also we've got some stuff to talk about. That's our, that's very important for Easter. Uh, I hope that you're planning on inviting somebody to your church at Easter. And if you go to Waters Church, my church, I, you, you know me, right? You know, you've got to start asking people now to come to church with you. Well, welcome in. No matter where you're watching from, uh, we're glad to have you. This is, believe it or not, episode 18 of season four. Episode 18 of season four on the deep end. And um, I want to make sure that you just do me this favor and like and subscribe the video. Uh, on YouTube, go to youtube.com slash the TV, youtube.com slash the deep end TV, uh, where you can uh, get notified uh, and, and, and know when we are live. That is a very important thing. You want to know when we are live on your smartphone or your tablet device. And uh, this would help us. You click the like button, you click the subscribe button, and then you click that little notification bell. Ring, ring. It looks like that. And that way you'll know when we are live every time. Hello to Twitch. Hello to Spotify. Hello to Facebook. Hello to everybody out there on radio in uh, Woonsocket, Rhode Island and in Tampa Bay. Um, My name is Tim. We are a weekly podcast, a weekly show. I guess not a podcast anymore. It's more of a video and podcast show of what's going on in culture or what's going on in the world. What's going on in the Bible? What does the scripture have to say about all this stuff? And how can we live faithfully as Christians in the world today. So uh, one more bit of promotional um, uh, talking for a moment, if you would. My book is av- my book is available. It's called Move, Entering into God's Promises for You. It is available now for $14.99 on Amazon or wherever you could find a book, I think, at timhatchlive.com slash books. I don't know why I said wherever you could find a book. It's only available on Amazon. So go to Amazon and check it out. Search Tim Hatch Move and you will find it. Or just go to timhatchlive.com slash books. Um, yeah, we uh, are once again in the middle of cancel culture uh, uh, problems or cancel culture antagonism. I've got a new member uh, of the Shelf of Shame. Uh, everybody, a new member, and she's not up there yet. And the reason why is because, frankly, she scares me. Uh, (laughs) Her name is Cara Dune, and I just want to put her right here. If you can see her on the screen in front of me, that's Cara Dune. She is the Disney um, princess, if you will. That's a true princess right there. She's 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 a girl that fights with gusto, and uh, she was part of the Mandalorian, and she's been canceled. And and so I'm scared of her. (laughs) That's why we're not going to put her on the show of shame. But cancel culture is at it again. And um, we want to make sure that we here on the deep end are constantly telling you what's going on in the world and how do we respond as Christians. So that brings me to what is it? What's time? What is it time for? Deep end news. Deep end news. The news you choose if you could choose news. Yeah, deep end news. Okay, so here we are. Uh, Cancel culture strikes again. And uh, the question we've been asking several weeks in a row 
is who gets canceled next. The answer today is Oral Roberts University. Oral Roberts University. Uh, let me just tell you who they are. They were a university founded by the late great evangelist, uh, Oral Roberts from the 19th century. He was a healing evangelist, but he was a powerful evangelist. He had his flaws. I'm not going to say he was some kind of perfect guy, but he had his flaws and he had his, you know, his luxury affinity and all that kind of stuff. And who doesn't, honestly, who doesn't like luxury? He could afford it. I mean, I know he made a lot of money in the ministry, but he also changed a lot of lives. And then he started a university for Christian ministry students who want to go out into the world and reach the world for Christ and do service in whatever profession that they have for the cause of Christ. Well, the basketball team at Oral Roberts University was a 15th seed in the NCAA tournament tournament this past month, uh, and they made history by being only the second 15th seed. You know that there's 64 teams, and then there's like four categories or four groups of those 64 teams. So one plays 16, two plays 15. So the really good teams play the really bad teams. Well, anyway. The, only the second time a 15th seed in the NCAA attorney made it to the Sweet 16, which is the final 16 teams. Now, they lost, but it was quite a, uh, quite a thing. It was actually quite a feat. And so uh, this was really cool for the university. Uh, it was a Cinderella story, and people thought, yeah, wow, that's what we'd like. We'd like to see David beat Goliath. Well, not everybody. <laughs> Not everybody likes to see David beat Goliath, especially when Goliath holds to biblical, I'm sorry, especially when David holds to biblical standards. So this article came out in uh, a publication called For the Win. It's run by USA Today. It's called, uh, the article says, NCAA uh, should boot Oral Roberts University due to biblical beliefs on LGBT issues, USA Today columnist says. Now that article is from ChristianHeadlines.com. The original article um, was basically saying that, you know, Oral Roberts University is not the feel-good March Madness story we need right now. And the reason why, according to this columnist, the reason why is because of the university's, quote, the university's deep, bigoted, anti-LGBTQ policies. And these cannot be uh, and should not be ignored, said the columnist. The columnist's name uh, is um, Hamal Javieri, and you might have heard about her recently because she has been fired. But I want to say, I want to repeat some of the things that she says from this article. It's kind of kind of horrible, honestly. She says, the Oral Roberts wants to keep its students tied to toxic notions of fundamentalism that fetishize chastity, abstinence, and absurd hemlines is a larger cultural issue that can be debated, Javier wrote. But what is not up for debate is their anti-LGBTQ plus stance, which is uh, nothing short of discriminatory, uh, discriminatory and should expressly be condemned by the NCAA. Okay, so that's what she said. Um, and the fallout was pretty vicious on YouTube, on, um, on Twitter, on social media. Uh, a lot of people standing up for the university, a lot of people standing against this kind of thing. The general populace said, you look, this their beliefs, you just leave them alone. Some people liked what she said. I'm sure many, many more people liked what she said than hated what she said because of the trends in culture today. But then this happened. USA Today, this is from Washington Examiner, USA Today race and inclusion editor says she was fired over tweet blaming white men for boulder shooting. So <laughs> what does she do? Uh, remember last week, we talked about this on the deep end. We talked about it, this uh, horrific shooting and our hearts go out to the victims' families uh, in Boulder, Colorado, uh, that was assumed to be another angry white man, but it ended up being a Syrian Muslim and an immigrant. And before she knew the facts, she tweeted out uh, the following tweet, quote, it's always angry white men, always. Uh, that's what Hamal Javari posted and then deleted from her Twitter account following the Monday grocery store massacre. So she gets fired for this, blaming white men for the Boulder shooting. And you, you might think, why does this stuff though keep happening? Like, okay, you know, this stuff of anti-Christian bias rooted in, um, you know, a, an affinity and a support for LGBTQ plus, you know, pretty much they own the alphabet, LGBTQIA, LMNOP, XYZ. Okay, so why? And well, by the way, before we get to that, it's just kind of ironic that her, her title at For the Win for USA Today was, quote, race and inclusion editor. And so here she was writing an article saying, 
not really for including those Christians who believe antiquated ways about sexuality and morality into the NCAA tournament. Race and inclusion editor. Anyway, just kind of ironic. This is what cancel culture does. This is how it acts. It's funny. Um, but you might be asking, and, and, I, and I think that is an important question to ask, why? Why do anti-Christian biases rooted in LGBT sympathies keep growing in our country? Why does this keep happening? Because it is. It is a growing trend. If you haven't seen it, you're blind. And the answer is because it was planned. The answer is because it was planned. Okay? I, I want to talk to you about something that you may have never heard about. It's called, it's called After the Ball. And it is a book that came out in 1989. It was written by two Harvard graduates, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen. Now, you may have heard of this, you may have not, but I think that a lot of people have forgotten about the fact that these two men wrote this book after the ball, and the subtitle is How America Will Conquer Its Fear of Hatred of Gays in the 1990s. And they basically spell out the game plan for the gay movement to succeed in this country. And by the way, they did it. <laughs> they won. They, you know, give them the trophy. It's over. The The language of LGBTQ plus is um, not just tolerated and accepted in our culture. It's celebrated. It's endorsed in the halls of power and the halls of media and the halls of uh, political office and the halls of corporate finance. I mean, it is, and of course, in our education system. It was planned, friends. It was planned, and you need to know your history. And I'm going to bring you through some of the things that they talk about in this book because they basically roadmap how's America going to shift from a traditional view of marriage and sexuality, aka according to the scriptures, according to the Bible, and basically according to a human history for as long as humans have been alive, honestly. I mean, it's been five, six years we've had homosexual marriage in this country, six years. The previous three, four, five, six, seven thousand years of human history, it was basically understood that man and woman make a marriage and make a family. And biology still <laughs> uh, still believes that. Um, so I want to walk you through this because it's important, because I want you to know the facts of how this was engineered into our society. It was engineered by some very smart men. These guys were graduates in law and graduates in psychology. They had successful practices and then they set out to justify the gay rights movement. And, and so here we go. Let me just pack, unpack this for you. The highlights from the book. First off, they said desens desensitization had to happen. And that means that they had to make sure that homosexuality was included with a, well, I'm sorry, was promoted through a flood of uh, related advertising uh, presented in the least possible fa offensive pa fashion. Uh, if straights can't shut off the power, uh, they um, they may at least eventually get used to being wet. Like that's what they were saying. If straight, I'm oh, sorry. The, the direct quote is: If straights can't shut the shower off, they may at least eventually get used to being wet. So desensitization, flood the airwaves, and that brings me to number two: endless messaging. Uh, they they talk about this. The fastest way. This is a quote from the book: The fastest way to convince straights that homosexuality is a, is commonplace is to get a lot of people talking about the subject in a neutral or supportive way, and that's exactly what's happening. Uh, they say in page 178, talk about gayness until the issue becomes thoroughly tiresome. So, <laughs> I mean, that's happened, right? I remember I was sitting in the, in a, in a, in a, uh, in, in a living room with a, with a non-Christian once. And I remember we were just watching something on television and they, uh, something gay came on the television screen. And they, even this non-Christian was like, you know, I get it. They want their rights, but does it have to be endless? Does it ha does everything have to, you know, revolve around homosexuality? And, you know, this is a non-Christian saying this thing. And there I am a Christian pastor, just kind of like let her say what she wanted to say. Cause that's true. This, this is, this was the game plan. This was the agenda. Maybe you don't know about this, but you should know about this and and the, and the one thing you can say about the gay rights movement is that they have been united around these these um efforts these these the game plan from the book after the ball so endless messaging and then there's something called a jamming uh yeah jamming the third tactic is to make opponents feel shame they call this jamming Make your opponents feel shame. Here, here's a quote from the book. All, all normal people feel shame when they perceive that they are not thinking, feeling, or acting like one of the pack. The trick is to get the bigot into the position of feeling a conflicting twinge of shame along with his reward whenever his homo hatred surfaces so that his reward will be diluted or spoiled. Uh, jamming succeeds, this is the book, succeeds insofar as it inserts even in the slightest frisson of doubt and shame to the previously unannoyed self-righteous pleasure. We need massive public exposure for the message to succeed. So in other words, 
they banked on the fact that human beings need to feel accepted. And so if we can get more and more people to feel like not embracing homosexuality will cause you to lose acceptance, then that will reverse the trend and people will just kind of like submit to their plan, right? I don't want to feel like I'm an outsider. I don't want to feel shame. So yes, I, I'm, I'm, I support gay rights. I support, I will hashtag it. I will put the little gay flag over, overlay on my, on my Facebook profile because I don't want to feel shame. I don't want to not be one of the pack. And so that's what they call it. They call it is jamming. Uh, and then number four, accusing religious people. And this is an interesting one. And this is the For the Win article from USA Today, accusing religious people. Uh, this is page 178, nine of the book, of the book, quote, gays can, gays can use talk to muddy the moral waters. That is to undercut the realization, realiz rationalization, <laughs> rationalizations that justify religious bigotry and to jam some of his psychic rewards. Uh, here's what they say. Portray such institutions as antiquated backwaters. There you go. Portray religious institutions as antiquated backwaters, badly out of step with the times and with the latest findings of psychology. And that's why they take over the DSM. That's why they've taken over psychi psychiatric medicine. That's why they take over and they, and they have shut down uh, conversion therapies and they have shut down anyone who stands opposed to this in the scientific psychological realm. And they have to keep redefining the terms in the DSM uh, and they have to keep uh, re-engineering how people are supposed to talk about these things and and it just keeps expanding because now it's not just about gays and lesbians it's about bisexuals and transgenders and then even those who might be transgender and then not transgender and then you know gender is fluid and you might not even fit into the two categories of gender so it's endless like expanse of you know uh, definitions that we have to rally around to make sure that everybody's protected and so what did they do they planned what did they set out to do make sure that religious people are portrayed as antiquated, backwater people, badly out of step with the times. So ORU has to get canceled. Uh, and then this this last one, oh, sorry, I think I have two more. Uh, this last, this, this fifth one, portray gays as victims. Portray gays as victims. This is page 183. Gays must be portrayed, this is a quote, as victims in need of protection so that straights will be inclined to reflect to adopt the role of protector. If gays present themselves instead as a strong and arrogant tribe promoting a defiantly unconformist lifestyle, they are most likely to be seen as a public menace and that warrants resistance and oppression. So they've got to be victims of what? They got to be victims of prejudice. This is why homosexual the homosexual movement has piggybacked off the civil rights movement, the very just, the very righteous civil rights movement of getting blacks the rights of whites in this country um, to undo that injustice. Uh, homosexual the homosexual movement has piggybacked off of this for some time now, and people don't see it, but they, they basically have adopted, co-opted the civil rights um agenda for the cause of homosexuality and transgender rights. Um, yep, I do have one more, I think. Attractive messaging is number six. Attractive presentation of gays. And so this is also from the book, number, uh, page 183. Uh, quote, persons featured in the media campaign should be wholesome and admirable by straight standards and completely unexceptional in appearance. In a word, they should be indistinguishable from the straights we'd like to reach. Uh, this is page 188, quote, paint gay men and lesbians as superior, veritable pillars of society. So they've got to be um, superior pillars of society and portrayed that way in all messaging. This is why you get a movie like The Imitation Game. Have you heard about this movie? It's about Alan Turing. He was a gay man who helped crack the code to beat the Germans and starring ben, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. And it was a wild success and nominated for all kinds of awards. Because why? Because this was the game plan. We have to make sure that we re even talk about the historic heroes of the LGBT movement. And we make sure that that people understand that these people uh, say basically save the world, <laughs> and then I don't have this on the screen. Uh, but the last the last um, uh, game plan uh, bullet list and after the ball was to accrue power and uh, corporate wealth. So. Yeah, page one, uh, page 212, run symbolic gay candidates for every high political office. And so, uh, you know, and then also invade the corporate world of America so that they can secure the corporate dollars and fund their movement. And the conclusion of the matter is this, they won, they won. 
because most Americans have an affinity toward uh, the homosexual movement, have a sympathy toward the gay plight. I mean, it's almost like they have more sympathy for the gay plight than the black plight at this point. And I got to say to my brothers and sisters who are black in Christ, aren't you offended a little bit? Aren't you bothered at all that, that they basically have taken your your righteous and just fight and co-opted it and basically um, <laughs> abducted it for the right to fornicate, the right to sexual immorality, to the right to impose these views on society. I mean, at some point, you know, we've got to think about that, that this is not right. This is not just. This is not acceptable. But but here we are. <laughs> here we are, uh, what, in 1989. So what is that 32 years later? And the gay movement agenda, detailed and after the ball, has indeed won. The sad part is Marshall Kirk, who is the co-author and possibly the instigator of the, uh, of the book, he was uh, badly oppressed by depression, severe migraine headaches, and babbling fits throughout his life. He died alone in his apartment and was found by friends days later in 2005. The other guy, uh, Hunter Madsen, he's still alive and he's up in Canada, but why do I bring this up? Why do I bring this up? Because what we are seeing today is the success of a planned redesign of American life. It is the success of a planned redesign of American life. Don't be shocked anymore, guys, about who gets canceled, especially when it's Christians, because it's going to happen more and more and more. Who, who's, who's going to stand in the end, right? Who's going to stand is my question. And remember I said last week, and this is important, cancel culture is moral high ground posturing. That's what it is by those who have forgone the moral code of Holy Scripture, right here, uh, and is denouncing the speck in someone else's eye when there's a log in their own. It's modern-day pharisaicalism with political power and corporate dollars. It's not going away. And as Christians, we must realize three things. I got three things about this from the news, okay? As Christians, we must realize, number one, we are supposed to be hated by the world. Number two, we must love those who hate us. See, Jesus, we once hated Jesus. We did. I know you think you were ambivalent toward Jesus. I'm going to get to that moment. You were not, and I was not, and no one ever is. We hated God. And when we were his enemies, the Bible says, Romans 5, 10, when we were his enemies, he still died for us. He loved us when we hated him. So we have to love those who hate us. Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Bless them, actually. Pour hot coals on their head by doing good for them. And then number three, we must remember that we are the church. We are not the world. We are the church. We are not the world. Which brings me to little Nas X. <laughs> I know you were expecting something else, right? Little Nas X. Okay. Uh, little Nas X dropped. Uh, my vernacular is getting better. <laughs> World even accurate. Little Nas X dropped 666 pairs of Satan shoes uh, on the world. They contained a little droplet of blood. They have the number uh, one, and they had a little fraction one and 666. Uh, they had a little pentagram symbol through the laces. They are. Uh, they have the Nike swoosh, although there's a lot of co uh, conflict about that. Uh, Nike is disavowing, disavowing uh, <laughs> very passionately. Uh, these sneakers, they did not endorse them, nor did they create them. And then it also has the passage there, Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So here we are, little Nas X using the old Satan to get ahead and to promote his next album. Let's be honest, that's what this is about. But that does not, that does not stop in other news. The Christians and the Christian leaders who are uh, terrified uh, they are terrified of this um, th this event. This th this uh, what, do, what do you want to call it? This I call it I call it a um, a, a, a stunt, publicity stunt. So ChristianPost.com reports: dangerous and evil Christian leaders react to rapper Little Nas X Satan shoes. And uh, there's countless Christian leaders who are just stepping up to say, avoid these shoes. This is even, this is a sign of the times. Look at how bad everything is. Look at, look at how much they hate us. And 
<laughs> we, we, we just do it to ourselves again and again. And as much as we, you know, we've got to be aware of, you know, like I just talked about the agenda of the gay rights movement and how it has a spe specified agenda to make home, um, to make Christians look outdated and backwatered. Um, we also have to be careful of freaking out when the world is the world. We have to be careful of freaking out when the world is the world. These Pay, these shoes cost one thousand and eighteen dollars. Uh, they they are uh, extraordinarily expensive. They don't even look that good. And he's you know he's using it to promote his album. That's really what he's doing. He's using this to promote his album. I don't give him. Uh, I don't want to give him any crap for that. I mean, he's in the business of making money, and you know he's doing his thing. And we got to learn how to not freak out. Could it be Remember the church lady? Yeah, remember the church lady? We don't, we don't want to be uh, the church lady. Am I correct? We don't want to act like everything is, everything is Satan. So I thought about this. What should, what should our response be? And I, I got an, I had this idea. I had this epiphany. Why don't I write an open letter to little Nas X? And then why don't I read it live on the deep end? Yes, I want to write because I want to say, he is the most honest pagan in the world right now. He is exactly what people are. God hating, God using, self-promoting people who will do anything to draw attention to themselves. And he's kind of proving what the Bible says about the human condition. That's the great thing. Like he's actually proving what this book says about the human heart. So Without further ado, I present to you my open letter to Little Nas X. Here it is on the screen. Dear Little Nas X, how you doing? Mission accomplished. Pastors and Christian leaders are freaking out about your Satan shoes. You did it. You got the attention you craved. I trust this latest endeavor has showed you how easy it is to get Christians all worked up in a tizzy over a promotional stunt. You see, Little Nas X, church people have a hard time understanding mankind. Believe me. I've tried to tell people over and over and over again that the heart of man is sinful, selfish, utterly opposed to God and everything about him. But they haven't listened. They still expect non-Christians to act more Christian. They still think mankind has free will and can willfully choose to be good if they would only try. <laughs> Thank you, little Nasex. You're the most honest pagan in the world right now. You confirm for countless masses that every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. See Genesis 6, verse 5. You have confirmed the psalmist's words. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable, abominable deeds. There is none who does good. See Psalm 14, verse 1. You have confirmed what, the Paul, what Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, that people are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and given themselves up to sensuality, greed, it's greedy to practice every kind of impurity. See Ephesians 4, 18 to 19. Maybe now, perhaps, the church will realize that the world is supposed to be godless and in love with darkness. Maybe now the church will seek the power of God to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that sets men free and stop trying to, quote, make people better, end quote. After all, a lot of good people are going to hell. In closing, I want you to know that I pray for you. I ask that Jesus Christ will open your heart to hear the gospel. He died for you on a cross so that you could live eternally. One day, I pray that the Lord will call you to himself. It is really your only hope. Sincerely, Tim Hatch, The Deep End. <laughs> My open letter to little Nas X. Did you get the message there? Did you kind of get the, you know, sarcasm in my, in my presentation there? Because we have to realize that when the world is the world, it's supposed to be that way. Sinners are supposed to sin. And let's not freak out. Let's not do what they want, okay? Let's not do that. Because um, I guarantee you, you tell your kid, I don't want you listening anymore to that music. He's going to go run to that music, okay? Just tell your little three-year-old, don't touch that hot stove. They're going to run to it, okay? The, the, the best way to get people to do what you uh, don't want them to do is to tell them not to do it. It's the human condition. Let's pray for them. Let's thank God that... <laughs> that we have a, a power within us through the Holy Spirit to speak truthfully to people who are lost and in darkness. They love dark. Mankind loves this stuff. And we should not be, we should not be all worked up in a tizzy about it. We should not be all freaked out about it. Okay, that, that is the bad news. Hey, how about this? Some really good news. 
and this is only going to apply to Waters Church people. Um, we opened up our new campus in Apollo Beach, Florida. Here's a picture of the old sanctuary. That was our first prayer meeting uh, in Florida. That was in December. And then this is a picture of the sanctuaries. We started to renovate it. It was an old Lutheran church uh, and they sold it to us for a great price. Thank you, Calvary Lutheran Church of Apollo Beach, Florida. And then this is a wider shot of the sanctuary. You can see the stained glass. You can see all the windows. You know what kind of church we are. Well, this is what happened on Sunday. We had 135 people in attendance. Uh, we had five people get saved. Uh, lots of people, lots of great energy, new faces from the community down here in Tampa Bay uh, area. We're so glad. That's the outside of the building before we started renovations and this is what it looks like now uh, and we are so excited for the future of our church waterschurch.org slash locations for a time and place near you and we just say the best is yet to come in 2021 okay that's deep end news and it's going to apply to the life of David as it always does. I don't just talk about this stuff because it you know, floats my boat. I want to talk about culture in a way that helps you relate to it through the word of God. So here we go. Let's get into the life of David. All right, the life of David. Here we are. The life of David, uh, part 18, season four of The Deep End. And uh, the title of this talk is Learning to Thank God for the Enemy's Attack. Learning to Thank God for the Enemy's Attack. The idea of the enemy attacking is common in the life of David. It's common in the life of the church. It's common for all of Christian history. In fact, I even had an episode in this season already called When the Powers That, that Be Attack. And I encourage you to go back and look if you've missed some of these episodes. But today... I want to take a different slant on why we should be thankful. Why, Christians, we should be thankful when the enemy attacks. God is going to use it, okay? A couple facts, you will be attacked as a Christian. Number two, God will allow it. Number three, God will do something through it. You will be attacked. God will allow it. God will do something through it. And you cannot be alarmed by this. You cannot be taken aback by this. This is the life of Christ. And in the life of David, we pick up where we left off. He's been anointed as king over all Israel, right? There was a seven-year period of civil war between the house of Israel to the north and the house of David to the south. That war is over. Abner defected to David, and then Joab killed Abner, and yada, yada, yada. A couple of small little more skirmishes. David is finally anointed king. We talked about that last week. And then he captured the city of Jerusalem, which was previously owned by the Jebusites. And then we are now at the point where David has established himself. He has built his royal palace, and he has established himself in the city of David on Mount Zion in Jerusalem and reigns over the entire nation. The king that God anointed is finally on top. That is great. That is wonderful and powerful and fantastic, and we're so glad about it. And you would think David is all excited and everything's going to be peachy and everything's going to be wonderful from this day forward and nothing, nothing to be worrisome about from this moment on. Wrong wrong no 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 why here's why because satan always attacks god's people he never stops and so we're going to look at how at the pinnacle of his life david is attacked in full force by that old ancient nemesis of the israelites the philistines let's go to the text 2 Samuel 5, verse 17 and here's what it says when the philistines heard that david had been anointed king over israel all the philistines went up all the philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. Okay. Let's talk about this. The Philistines come and attack David in full force. Another translation says they came out in full force. Uh, they come out and attack David in, in full force when David is in full command of Israel. Now, never think that the, day, the devil is going to leave you alone, Christian, especially when you have arrived at a pinnacle moment in your life, in your profession, in your career, in your hopes. Never think that. The devil does not the devil does not say, oh goodness, now he's in that career. Now he's at that place in life. Now he's married. Or now she's finally successful. Now she's got this child that she prayed for for years. I'm gonna leave them alone now. There's no chance for me now. It's over. They're they're so full of faith and they're so full of power. No, the devil will attack you when you arrive at the pinnacle. In fact, he will he will attack you more forcefully when you arrive at the pinnacle. Why? Because he knows that your defenses will be down. You think you have arrived. 
You think you've arrived. So, so that's that's something that you got to watch out for. And this is what you got to see in the life of David. Also, this shows something about the spiritual struggles that we all face. Um, I want to take you back to the first five chapters of uh, Second Samuel. So far, David has been struggling with the, the the Israelites. He's been struggling with this battle and this conflict with the with his fellow believers in Yahweh. It's been this internal struggle. Now that struggle's over. Guess what? The external struggle comes upon him. This shows us something about the spiritual struggle we all face for David and for you. See, David's had to, uh, David no longer struggled with the struggles of internal conflict. Now he has moved on to the struggle of external conflict. And this is after seven years of civil war. And it's important for you to understand this because in your spiritual life, you're going to have both. You're going to have the internal conflict, and we talked about that in the battle within a couple weeks ago, but you're also going to have the external conflict with the powers of this world, with Satan, with the worldly powers, uh, with, uh, you know, the powers of an un ungodly unbelievers. You're going to struggle with this, and you're going to struggle with the spiritual forces and the principalities and the rulers in the heavenly places. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians verse 11, uh, chapter 11. He says, he talks about all the times he was whipped, Okay, verse 24, he's talking about this. Five times I was, uh, I received at the hands of the Jews 49 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I drift on the sea on frequent journeys uh, in danger from rivers, robbers, my own people, uh, Gentiles, the city, in danger in the wilderness, in danger of sea, danger of false brothers, toil, hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger, thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from all the other things, there's daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And I, I've never really uh, experienced all the trauma that Paul experienced in terms of uh, Christian ministry, but I will tell you that there is great pressure on Christian leadership. There is. And this is why I covet your prayers. Uh, deep enders. I covet your prayers. Uh, please do pray for me because there is a lot of stress and there is a lot of pressure on God's leaders. Um, you know, we, we, we've, we've got the gospel to preach, but then we've got the enemies. And I'm not talking about these people that just come and like shoot us. They don't really shoot us. They just, you know, lob bombs on Facebook at us or they lob bombs on an email at us and whatever. And then, you know, there's people who lead the church. And then on top of all that, there's people who are just struggling with sin and they go up and they go down, they go up, they go down. And it's a real struggle. It's a real, it's a real um, battle that goes on on a constant basis. And so sometimes I'll go through seasons as a leader, just like Paul, where I experience these external realities, these external battles, but then I also have to go inside and I have to deal with these internal battles, just like you have. We all have them. This is why Paul will say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, he will say, I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. See, Paul knew that there was a battle outside of him for the cause of the gospel, but there was also a battle inside of him, that battle with sin. He faced it. You will too. You will face both the internal and the external struggle, both the internal and the external struggle. And it's going to sometimes feel like just when you, uh, you, you got the internal struggle like done, that's when the external problems begin <laughs> and it happens on a regular basis. And sometimes, sometimes you'll get it at, you know, both, both internal and external at the same time, which is what I want to put on the screen. Actually, it brings me to my truth today. At times, Christian, you will experience attacks from all sides. Expect it and know that the Lord is powerful enough for it. That should actually have powerful for enough for it. Sorry that it's cut off there. The font is too big. You're going to experience attacks from all sides. Expect it and know that the Lord is powerful enough for it. It's just a fact. One more one more thing to consider about the timing of the Philistines attack on David here in 2 in 2 Samuel chapter 5. Remember that David had been their ally. Remember he he absconded off to the Philistines when he was hiding from Saul because he knew that Saul was too afraid of the Philistines. And so now, now he's no longer their ally because he has just allied himself with who? With the Israelites, the house of Saul. So now he has joined himself to the Philistines' enemies. And that's why, that's why they don't want to leave him alone anymore. And I thought about this, and this brings me to an important point. It brings me to an important point about why we should be thankful when the enemy attacks. Here's why. Because when the enemy attacks, we get a chance to do two things. We get a chance to remember who the real enemy is, okay? 
You get to remember that you're not actually fighting flesh and blood. You're fighting the devil. You're fighting the demons of hell. You're fighting the evil forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, Ephesians 6, 12. But number two, you get to unite with your true family. See, Israel was finally united under David. They had finally come together. And I believe this with all of my heart, friend. Listen to this very carefully. I think this was God's way of saying, stop fighting each other and start fighting the real battle. It's time for you to unite, Israel. I need you to be my people united under one name, Yahweh. And I need you to fight the battle that's worth fighting. Can I share with you some more news about the church in America that's going to kind of give us hopefully some motivation here about the church maybe maybe being done with attacking each other and, and arguing with each other about non-essentials and then maybe rallying around what is essential, the gospel, the Lord Jesus, the, the resurrected King. Can I give you some news to help us, help motivate us to rally and unite? According to a recent study by Gallup polling, for the first time in American history, the uh, church membership has dropped below 50% for the first time in American history. Now, the past 20 years, according to this article in Forbes, the past 20 years have seen a sharp drop off already, falling from 70% to 47% in that time. COVID restrictions had a lot to do with escalating that decline, but the declines were already happening. The Washington Examiner reports that at least three churches close every single day in America. At least three churches close every single day in America. And this this article goes on to talk about 47% of Americans said they were a member of a church. Uh, that's down from 50% in 2018 and 70% in 1999. It says U.S. church membership hovered around the 70% mark for 60 years since Gallup first started measuring it in 1937, though the figure has been steady decline since the turn of the century. 22,000. The trend is, the article goes on, the trend coincides with a growing number of Americans who don't express a religious preference, which has grown from 8% in 1998 to 21% in the last three years, as well as drop in the number of religious American families, uh, religious Americans formerly belonging to a church, which has fallen 13 points over the past 20 years to 60%. Uh, Gallup's research links declining membership with age, uh, 60, 66% of people born before 1946 belong to a church compared to 58% of baby boomers and 50% of Gen Xers and just 36% of millennials told Gallup polling that they belong to a church, just 36%. Now, in spite of these decreasing numbers, the American church is, the, the, the American, um, America is still a very religious country by comparison with other countries, but it's not on the right track and it's not following the proper trajectory. And, um, you know, we've got to be aware of this. We, we, we've got to be aware that the, the, the trend is um, going a certain way. And maybe it's time for us as the church to not be church lady, okay? <laughs> and to get back to uniting, uniting around what is actually important. What is actually important? And what is that? to fight the battles that the Lord has called us to fight. So let's get back to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 20. Here's what happens when those Philistines come up against David. It says in verse 20, And David came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. Then he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Perazim. And the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. And First Chronicles tells us that they burned those idols. Taking the idols of another nation was a sign that you had completely d- destroyed not just that nation, but that nation's gods. Now, what I love about this moment is that David describes the battle, and it's important because he says it's Baal Perazim, the Lord of the breakthrough. That's what that word means. And commentators talk about the fact that David is so overwhelmed with how easily he won the battle. It was decisive that it seemed to him as if the Lord literally had just blown his enemies away. And the Lord anointed David for this. The Lord anointed David for the battle. To be and 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 to and he anointed him for the battle to be better than he expected. That's why he says the Lord has broken through for me. Let me just give some pastoral care for some people who are going through a battle. God never, ever, doesn't have enough power for you. Yeah, double negative. God always has enough power for you. You whatever battle you're facing, God is able 
to empower you for it. It might be harder than ever, but God is, but God has the power. It might be different from another angle. It might be facing a different battle than you've ever faced before, but God has the power. It might be unexpected, but God has the power. So David wins this battle seemingly easy. And you would think now that's going to go to his head and he's going to, you know, uh, just kind of feel pride and arrogance and never look to the Lord again. And that's it. Nope. Look what happens. Very next verse. Verse 22 of 2 Samuel 5. And the Philistines came, came up. What? What's the word? Came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. They had just been beaten wholeheartedly. The Lord broke out against them. They had been squashed. And, and what do they do? They come right back. And that's how the enemy is. He never gives up. He never stops. So they spread out again in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, you shall not go up. Go around to the rear and come against them opposite the balsam trees. Now, I love this because David says, look, Lord, they're coming against me again. And instead of going out there just fighting, saying, oh, I know how to beat these guys. No, he goes back to the Lord. He goes back and seeks the Lord again. Lord, shall I go up? And the Lord says, yes, but not the way you went before. This time, come again, come around the rear and come against them from the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching, verse 24, on the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself. For then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him, struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. I love this because David doesn't let pride go to his head. What do we see? We see an anointed king who has a humble reliance on God, no matter how successful he is. And that's what we need. We need a we, we need a humility to say, God, I, I depend on you. I might have fought this battle before. This might be the same enemy, but I need your direction for today. That's why Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. He's not just talking about daily food. He's talking about daily wisdom from God, what God wants to give us in terms of fighting the battle that we face every day and facing it with fresh strategy. What do you want to say to me today, Lord? This is why the scripture says, trust not in your own understanding, Proverbs 3, 5. Don't lean on that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, right? So God says, don't go face them face to face. You go around them. You come against them in the balsam trees. And then when you hear the sound of the marching on the tops of the balsam trees, what's that about? David, I want you to hear that I'm with you. Who would be marching on the tops of the balsam trees? I'll tell you who will be marching. God's armies, the angels. They're marching out against the devils, uh, the, the, the Philistines for David. And this is what you need to understand. The Lord is marching for you, Christian. We are surrounded by ar the armies of the Lord. Do you pray, and I hope you do, do you pray for the angels of God to be around you and your family? I hope you do. And, and husbands, let me talk to you for a moment. This is your responsibility. Pray that, that your Father in heaven will surround your children with angels, will surround your house with angels. You know, there's a battle going on in the heavenly places. Dave, um, Daniel heard about this from the angel who came to him and brought the message to him in Daniel chapter 10. And he talks about how the prince of Persia resisted him for 21 days. But the prayers of Daniel uh, empowered the messenger of the Lord to come through that battle and bring him the message. See, I think that when you, you've got to, you want to be inspired to pray, you've got to see prayer for what it is. It is a, it is fuel to the heavenly realms. It is fuel to the unseen realm around you so that you can fight and win the battle that you are facing today with the stat, with the tactic, tactics, excuse me, that you need today. Now, I wish that this just continued with Daniel, Day, um, David in this passage, but it, it didn't. Unfortunately, it did not. Let me just show you something here in this very next passage, very next chapter, chapter six. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits and throws on the cherubim. cherubim. And they carry the Ark of, the God, of God on a new cart. Okay, this is David's idea. Let's get the Ark of God. Let's go up there, get the Ark of God. It's been out of place for a while, and I want to have it in my house, basically was what he's saying. So they carry the Ark of God on a new cart, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill. And in Yuzah in Ohio, the sons of Abinadab were driving the new cart with the ark of God uh, and Ohio went before the ark. Okay. Now, this is a um, interesting moment here. David does something that is not David-like. It's kind of crazy. He is going after the ark of God. He does not consult God about how to bring the ark of God into the, into the city of David. This this is this is. And, and bad things are going to happen. The results are going to be disastrous. And, and there's some details about how they handle the ark that we need to point out. There's some details. I want you to look at it again because it says that they put it on a new cart. They put it on a new cart. 
Okay, that's not how they were, the people of Israel were supposed to carry the Ark of God. Uh, it was very detailed in the Torah, the first five books of Moses, how they were to carry the Ark. Um, but they aren't doing it that way. It was a specific Le Levite family that was supposed to carry the Ark. They were supposed to carry it on poles. Uh, they were supposed to sacrifice burnt offerings as they carried it. Uh, they were supposed to have this specific family, these descendants of, the, uh, of Levi the, uh, from the house of Aaron to carry the Ark uh, and make sure that they carried it a certain way and only the way that God wanted because it was holy. Because it was, it's the presence of God. It is holy. And we've got to remember what holiness means. Holiness is not being good. It's not morality. It's being separate. It's being above. It's being altogether different and distinct. That's what holiness is. And God's number one characteristic in the scriptures is holy. Isaiah says, it says it like this, that he saw the cherubim and seraphim flying above the Lord in the temple. And it says that they cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of Almighty. When Hebrew repeats words, it's the way of saying that uh, it is emphasizing that word. Uh, he's not just holy. He's not just holy, holy. He's holy, holy, holy. In other words, there's no one like God. And we have to have respect for him. But David doesn't do that. He actually carries the ark brazenly on a new cart. And where did he get this idea? I mean, think about it. Where did this idea come from? It came from the Philistines. See, back in 1 Samuel chapter 6, the Philistines were getting devastated because they had stolen the Ark of God from the people of Israel and their uh, god Dagon had been crushed. Um, they, they, they left the Ark in the temple of Dagon and, and then they came in the morning and Dagon was falling on the floor before the Ark and then they came, put him back up and then they came back the next day and the Ark of God was there with Dagon and this time Dagon was on the floor and this time his hands had been cut off and so then they said, all right, we got to get rid of it and then tumors broke out on the people and then they're like, we got to get rid of the Ark of God. It's just bringing the cancer upon us. So what did they do? It says this in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7. It says that they, their priest told them, take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there have never been a yoke. So here we go. New cart on milk cow, uh, carried by new milk cows on which there has never been a yoke and, and, and yoke the cows of the cart, but take their cows home away from them and take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put it on a, in a box at its side, the figures of gold, which you were returning to him as a guilt offering, then send it off and let it go away. So the Philistines had this idea, like, this is how we're going to carry the ark of God. This is how we're going to treat the presence of the Lord. We're going to treat it brazenly. We're just going to have these cows carry it back because we don't want to come close to it. And listen, David picked up on that and took that as like the game plan. <laughs> he took that and said, that's the game plan. That's how you're supposed to treat God. That's how we're supposed to, you know, handle God. And disaster strikes. Let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at the disaster. Verse 5. Some of you don't get this passage. I'm going to explain it to you today. Verse 5 says, And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, as the ark came in, right? With songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put his hand out of, put his put out his hand, I'm sorry, to, to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. And we say, Whoa. That's weird. Why would God do that? All he's trying to do is steady the ark. Do you know why? Because this is God saying enough is enough. This is, this is God saying enough is enough. You are treating my presence with contempt. You are my people. You are supposed to treat my presence with a certain holiness and respect. And you are not to follow the ways of this world in relating to me. You as it touches the ark, he's put to death. Swift judgment. By the way, whenever God does something new in the world, there's usually swift judgment. Think about Ananias and Sapphira swiftly judged because God was doing something new in the world and they wanted to take part of it to promote themselves. And so what you have here is a tipping point. God's saying enough is enough, right? You, you guys have lost respect. You guys don't know what is in the law, what is in the wor word, the Torah, concerning how you're supposed to carry and handle the presence of God. Well, David is struck by this. David doesn't know what to do. It says in verse 8, and David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah this day. Now, ironically, just a few uh, verses ago, David was talking about uh, uh, Baal Perazim. God has broken out against my enemies. Now God has broken out against us. And David in fear does not bring the ark of God into his city. Look what it says in verse 9. David was afraid of the Lord that day. He said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in his house, in the house of Obed-Edom, the Kittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all its household. By the way, Obed's name means servant. This is a moment. It's an important moment for the church. It provides a teaching for us. It does. Okay, let me recount it first in Israel's perspective so that you can learn something from our perspective. I won't put this on the screen. For the last 
400 years, this has been Israel's history. The judges rule, that was about 325 to 350 people, uh, 50 years, 325 to 350 years. Samuel is the last judge. Then they asked for a king like all the other nations. That was episode one of season four. If you go back, you'll listen to it. Uh, give us a king like all the other nations. We want a king like them. So God says, okay, you want a king like the, the other nations, not a king like mine? <clears throat> I'm going to give you Saul. And they are ruled by Saul, this self-centered king for 40 years. And then there's a civil war after Saul dies for seven years between the house of David and the house of Saul. And so uh, eliminating the 325 years of the judge's rule, you have to see the result here of just since Samuel that Israel had spent so much time fighting itself and its selfishness for so long, 50 plus years, that they forgot how to treat the presence of the Lord. <laughs> they were so consumed with, with, with fighting themselves. They didn't know how to seek the Lord anymore. I want to show you a passage. It's in, second, it's in 1 Chronicles 3.13. This is a, a harmony passage with uh, 2 Samuel 5. 1 Chronicles 3.13 says, Then let us bring again the ark of the Lord our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. You see what they're saying? We forgot how to seek God in the days of Saul. We were so busy. Listen, this is, this is the point. This is all, the whole episode hinges on this. I hope you're still with me. We were so busy trying to be like the world. We forgot how to practice the presence of God. We were so busy trying to, you know, have a kingdom that looked important, have a king that could fight our battles, have prominence and notoriety. And we got so caught up in that, we forgot what it's like to be in God's presence. Because if we're in God's presence, listen, this is, this is true for them, it's true for you. If you're in God's presence, it does not matter what the world does to you. Could it be that the church in 2021 in America is in the exact same place as the Israelites were in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and 6? Modern Christianity needs to stop trying to be the world and live as lights in the world. Modern Christianity needs to stop trying to be the world and instead live as lights in the world. So what do you mean, pastor? What do you mean being like the world? I mean, we got to stop fighting each other like the world does. The world fights each other. That's what the world does. Wars and rumors of wars in this world. That's what's supposed to happen. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to be for each other. We're supposed to not be about ourselves. In modern American Christianity, the church is a lot, of, a lot like the world. It's about me. It's about my own you know, identity, my, what's the will of God for me? What's my life all about? Help me feel good about me. That's, that's not Christianity. That's just worldliness with a Christian stamp on it. That's, that's where we've come to. Consider some of the worship songs of our age. It's more about us than God. It's more about love, his love for us than our love for him. We, 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 we need to get back to ce ce um, celebrating the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice for our sins. We need to get back to his holiness, his righteousness. We need to get back to celebrating who he is and not who we are. There's so many Christian songs out there. They're all about how God loves us. And I get it. He does love us. But can we sing about his glory, his, his wonder, his, his awesomeness? Read the Psalms and you'll see that more often than not, they talk about his glory. For many Christian leaders, it's about, it's, it's about business success in the church, numbers and nickels, noses and nickels, we like to say in the church world. <laughs> how many people come to your church and how much money and how big is your building? It's just business principles invading the church. Or it's about feeling good. Christian Smith from Notre Dame, a professor at Notre Dame wrote a book called Lost in Translation about how the next generation does not follow Christianity, but a thing called moralistic therapeutic deism. He came up with that. He coined that term, moralistic therapeutic deism, a feel-good, me-centered uh, religion with a God in heaven who exists to make my dreams come true. And when I do good, I feel good. And when I do bad, I feel bad. And that's, that's really what it's all about. And this is where we are as a, a Christian community. This is where we are as a Christian world right now. Or it's about my dreams, it's about my goals, it's about my plans. Instead of your kingdom come, your will be done. Or it's about just gathering in a building on Sunday to hear good sermons and listen to good music instead of getting out of that building and being the church and loving people who are nothing like us to win them to Christ, to fight for them, to fight for people, to do good works. We have to repent. We have to stop trying to be the world because the world has that down, friend. The world has that down. Maybe we are exactly where Israel was in 2 Samuel chapter 5. Maybe that's why people don't want anything to do with the church. 
because we're just like them anyway. So why would they want to go to a church building where people are more like them than anything? We got to be distinct. We got to remember that we are holy because he is holy. We are not, we are holy. We are to be holy because he is holy. First Peter says. So in summary, what is this really all about? Yes, the church is shrinking and membership is decreasing. But let me ask you a question. Is that really a bad thing? Maybe the church needs to wake up through this moment and see what really matters. Let's fight the real enemy. The, the real enemy is the God of this world who darkens the mind of unbelievers so that they, so that they, do, so that they do not repent and, uh, and hear the truth. We, we, we need to fight the real battle, not us, not ourselves. Yes, and number two, yes, the world is starting to put pressure on the body of Christ. But is that a bad thing? Perhaps God is using this external warfare to wake us up to the spiritual condition, the, leth the lethargy in our churches and, and, and motivate us to repent and turn to him. I, I mean, friends, remember that the church started with 120 people on the day of Pentecost. 120, 120 people down from 5,000 plus that Jesus fed with the five loaves and the two fishes. Remember that. The church has shrunk before. <laughs> the church has shrunk before. The church will shrink again. It's not about the size of the church. It's about the God of that church. It's about the presence of the Holy Spirit in that church. And so I thought about this as the final thought I had in this, in this talk. The truth is God will use all things to accomplish his purpose through us, to bear witness to the, real, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. You see, I think that the, antith the antithesis expressed by our culture for the Christian religion is actually going to be used by God to cleanse the church of its weak and useless ways, which it has adopted from the world. This is God's way of chiseling us, sharpening us, so that we get back to being what he wants us to be. And maybe we'll forget this idea that Christianity is about what it can do for me. We'll forget about the church should be uh, this place that I really love, that's good for my kids, that's good for my family. I get that. We want that. We want it. And, I, and I'm a church leader, so I want church that's good for you, but I want you not to just come to church as a consumer. I want you to be the church as a participator. And maybe we'll get over our stupid little de de denominational divisions and stop arguing about non-essentials and stuff like that. And maybe we'll, all we'll also clean house and repent and turn to God and, and, and stop <laughs> stop doing exactly the same things as the world does. The, the divorce rate is just as high in the church as it is in the world. The, 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 the rates for pornographic addiction is just as high in the church as it is in the world. The, the, the rates for what we watch on television, what we, what we participate in, it's just the same. We've got, we, we've got to remember we're different. We're to be holy as he is holy. And then maybe, maybe we'll stop worrying about Satan's shoes and cancel culture and how they feel about us and remember that if God is for us, who can be against us? And that is the life of David today. That's our talk today. God will use this to accomplish his purpose. And so this week on Holy Week, who have you invited to church? You've got a chance here to, to put a dent in that 47% number. Get some people back where they belong in the house of faith. Hey, look, uh, uh, like us on all of our social media, follow us. I only do that so that you can make sure that you are always aware of what's going on with the deep end. Check us out at, uh, the deep end, uh, dot TV. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, all the thing. Make sure that you're liking and subscribing, um, all over the place. And I say this again, one more time, you got to hit the like button. You got to make sure that you subscribe and you got to make sure on YouTube, youtube.com slash the deep end TV, you hit that notification bell. That way you can get notified of whenever we are live, uh, here on the deep end. I'm glad that I brought this to you today. I know we didn't say we we're going to do a episode this week, but I felt like we should, and I'm glad we did. And I hope to see you next week on the deep end. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of The Deep End. The Deep End is brought to you by listeners and viewers just like you. Consider giving today. Hey, if you don't have a home church, come and check us out at one of our campuses. Visit waterschurch.org and you can find a time and location that fits your schedule. Tune in next week for The Deep End with Tim Hatch.